loving and, and loving and ministering and lifting. And Lord, we know that that's, that's your heart because we see it in your living word. So we just praise you for that this morning. We, we know that we have the promise of your Holy Spirit. And we just thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're here this morning. We thank you for ministering the presence of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for your graciousness to us. We thank you for the way that you love us. And Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to hear your word, Lord, as we open it together this morning. Lord, say what you will, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, turn to 1 Kings. We, uh, I announced three or four weeks ago that we were going to take a break before we got into the book of Colossians, which is what we'll pick up likely next Sunday. Uh, we finished the book of Philippians, and I just felt like the Lord had really spoken strongly to me that he wanted us for a few weeks to speak on some things outside of our, our, our normal uh, teaching routine, some things that the Holy Spirit has impressed on, you know, myself and Pastor Josh and maybe others, we'll see. Um, but as we prepare for the book of Colossians, I almost feel like in some ways the Lord would, would have us individually prepare for it. Colossians is that book in the Bible that tells us that Jesus is supreme that he is preeminent. I mean, that is the theology that we learn in the book of Colossians. But the problem that we face as a church as we approach Colossians is that we're instructed, if we really believe that to be true about Christ, to then live our lives as if it were really true. And when you believe that Jesus is everything, when you believe that he's supreme, when you believe that he reigns and he rules and, and that the fullness of God is, is within him and because he's within you that you have access to the fullness of God, you realize this, that he's sufficient for all your needs. And the church of uh, every generation has struggled with that, but the church in this modern era struggles with that truth perhaps more than any uh, other generation has. And you see that struggle underscored by the fact that we run to the world to help us deal with the problems of our souls. And the one who created the spirit and created the soul and who redeemed the spirit and who redeemed the soul is the physician that we turn to for the ailments of the soul and the spirit. We're authorized because this flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God to do whatever we can to take care of it and to try to eat right and to find a good doctor and do the best we can throughout the time of our dwelling in this flesh, but it's going to die. But when it comes to the spirit and when it comes to the soul, the believer in Jesus Christ was never meant to turn to the world for help. And it's the picture in the scriptures of every time the Israelites would turn their faces back to Egypt when things got tough. So I just want you to kind of tuck that in and meditate on it as the uh, next week or so goes by and we prepare ourselves to approach Colossians. But this morning, 1 Kings... Um, Chapter 17 is uh, basically the introduction to Elijah the prophet. And I last week was uh, just praying about what the Lord would have me to share on. And I had two dreams. I don't live my life on dreams. I'm very skeptical of myself. When I have a dream, I'm not quick to say that it was of God. I want to judge it on the basis of the scriptures, but I also know that the scriptures tell us that uh, we receive dreams from the Lord, but they better be square with the scripture. And I also believe God confirms things that he may speak to a man or woman in a dream through his word. And uh, so I had a dream 
And in the dream, um, I was speaking in a, another place. And strangely enough, I had uh, two dreams. Uh, and in both, there was a pastor friend of mine and his wife, which I thought was very unusual because they haven't been on my radar at all. And I dreamed on Monday night and then again on Thursday night. But at any rate, within the dream, um, I approached the pulpit and I didn't know what to share on and that that's a real um, you know circumstance that uh, I've experienced before and as a pastor I don't know if I've ever shared this <laughs> with you before but I've had a lot of dreams uh, that I don't believe were from God um, where as I was preaching please don't fulfill this today and make it prophetic <laughs> People one by one left the building until there was nobody left. And uh, I think that is the fear of a pastor that plays out in the dream world more than likely. But in this case, and this is how I, one of the reasons I believe it was from the Lord, is because nobody left, which was very unusual. And not only did I not know what to preach on, the Lord gave me a phrase and I started to turn in the Bible to look for it and could not find it. And we sat there as they waited on me for 30 minutes. And what was so unusual about it was they were just fine with it. And I thought, this is really a unique circumstance. Because usually, you know, like everyone would be gone. Um, but the phrase the Lord gave me was, what doest thou here, Elijah? And that's Old King James, but I learned that text from the Old King James when I uh, was in jail in the early years of my faith, and it became very important to me. So it is very normal that the Lord would speak it to me that way. There's a lot of history with me that uh, is attached to that phrase, what doest thou here, Elijah? So in 1 Kings into the middle of Elijah's story, uh, we come to that event that probably everyone in here has read about or knows about or has at least heard about in some way, and that's uh, his challenge to the false prophets on Mount Carmel. How many of you, just by a showing of hands, you've either heard about it or you've read about it? Lift up way high. So most people, okay, and if you haven't, Praise God, it's a really cool thing. This will be an introduction to it this morning. I'm not going to talk a lot about it. But at any rate, what happens is Elijah, who is filled with zeal for God. I mean, there is no other prophet in all of the scriptures except perhaps John the Baptist. And that we can only take from what Jesus uh, says about John, not what we see so much. But there seems to be no other prophet that is filled with so much zeal as Elijah the prophet is. And he is bold, and he is transparent, and at the same time he's somewhat mystic, and he is capable of elation and depression, and he seems to be a warrior uh, and a man of God all at the same time. He's an amazing figure in the scriptures and I think that's why Elijah figures so prominently in all of the Bible but he comes to this place where because all of Israel essentially has turned away from God and they're worshiping the Baals under King Ahab and his wife Jezebel which is the worst influence that's ever presided over Israel so much that the prior worst influence, Jeroboam, and what he did is said to be trivial in light of how far away from God they take the nation. So King Ahab turns the nation to idolatry, and the nation follows him, and the nation is prospering, and everybody seems in their false worship, in their compromised uh, Judaism, and you can kind of just frame that over today's people of God, Christians, and a compromised Christianity because they waited on the Christ as well. They were, in a sense, the Old Testament Christians. But they're all delighting themselves in it. At the beginning of his administration, they're prosperous, 
and everything seems fine for them and Elijah can't stand it because God is not glorified and because the people are worshiping a false god and false gods, plural. And he becomes so vocal in his faithfulness to speak the word of God that he becomes enemy number one of King Ahab. And Ahab, in fact, on the heels of his what would be for three years at least, a final prophecy that the heavens were going to be shut up and it wouldn't rain, that a famine would hit the land and remain for a time and not be uh, ended until he spoke again. Uh, he becomes enemy number one and a hit is put out on Elijah and Ahab sends men throughout every nation of the then known world, so far as we know, looking for uh, Elijah. And he even does it in such a way it's so important to him that he will extract information from them using e evidently torture uh, tactics. He wants to take Elijah and he wants to take him out. He wants to kill him. So Elijah has been off on his own and he's been hiding at the instruction of the Lord, he knows where to go and how he's going to be provided for. And it's amazing. In one place, he's provided for by ravens that bring uh, bread from God. And he's fed by the brooks in that area. Later, he's provided for by a widow who is the poorest person in this generation so far as we know. She has nothing except a little left to eat and die. If you remember that story, you'll know what I'm talking about. But God blesses her and enables her not only to provide for herself and her son, but also for Elijah. And then finally, he receives this instruction to go show himself fearlessly. He goes and he meets with Obadiah, who is a man of God still in service to the king, who's actually been hiding the only prophets of the Lord that were left, and most likely they were kind of prophets in training, people that were of lesser maturity and younger in the Lord. But God was using Obadiah to disciple them and protect them right under the king's nose. And he says, Obadiah, go and tell the king that today I want to meet with him. And Obadiah is scared because he's like, man, they've looked everywhere for you. I'm not going to do that. And then the Lord will spirit you away somewhere and they'll take my head for it. And he says, no, I'm serious. I'm, I'm going to present myself today. So Obadiah goes and tells the king, Elijah presents himself. And Elijah tells him, today's going to be the day. Go gather all of your false prophets and tell them with the whole nation of Israel to meet me up on Mount Carmel. And today we're going to decide who God is, whether Baal or whether the Lord. And they go up on the mountain, 450 prophets of Baal and 400 other grove prophets, 850 false prophets in all. And he says, go ahead, build your altar, do whatever you need to do, and let the God who answers by fire be God. And he says this in the midst of the whole congregation, this nation that's gathered, that has largely been deceived into this false worship. Still thinking they're Jews. Still using the name of the Lord to worship, but compromised, running after the world and all that it has to offer, idolatrous. Living for themselves and for things. And he says, today let the God who answers by fire be God. Because see, false gods never demand anything from you. Not really. I mean, not anything that you don't kind of already want to give or think is a pretty fair trade anyway. They just promise you a bunch of the things that your flesh wants to take advantage of. And in taking advantage of them, you drift away from the Lord until finally you're completely ensnared. You're trapped, and this is where the nation was. So these false prophets build their altar. They get out, and they start to call upon Baal. And if you know the story, this goes on all day long. And Elijah's in the background, and he's actually taunting them. And he's like, hey, just 
holler a little bit louder because he might be, you might have got him in the stall. He might be taking a pee in the bathroom or something. And if you holler a little louder, I'm sure he's going to hear you. They get in their anger into this frenzy where they actually start, which was part of their pagan worship. So these are the true devotees here. They start to slash themselves. Now they're bleeding because they've cut themselves because they're like, man, we need to get the attention of Baal. And here's the reality. They've seen their God show up for them in the past. It's not that he's always been non-responsive. They're not cutting themselves because they, you know, are aware this God never interacts or talks or does anything. They're doing it because he's responded to the same foolishness in the past, but now it's just silence. Other than their chaotic noises, there is nothing. The scripture says nobody responded. And the reason why was because God muzzled the mouth of hell so that in that moment it was paralyzed and could do absolutely nothing. Because this show is not only before all of Israel, but I think it's before demons and angels gathered. The whole universe's eyes in this day are on Mount Carmel. Because there's going to be a witness that the God who answers by fire, that's very important, remember that. My message has little to do with Mount Carmel. But the God who answers by fire is God. And this is going to show who that he's God? Elijah? No, Elijah knows that he's God. This is going to show the world. This is going to show idolaters that he's God. See, you and I don't need him to answer by fire. If we do, that says something really bad about the place where we're at in our relationship with him. But the God who answers by fire be God. So Elijah builds his altar, drenches the thing with water. The sacrifice, the wood, drenches it. Calls on the Lord. And then we pick up the passage where he begins to pray. And it came to pass, this is chapter 18, verse 36. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. No real prophet just does what he wants to do. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, so that this people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned their hearts back to you. And that's Elijah's heart in this whole thing. He doesn't want to hurt and destroy and inflict. He wants to see people come to repentance. And then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust. And it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let one of them escape. So they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. And then Elisha said to Ahab, who now Ahab is king. These men have served at his behest throughout his administration. And more than that, his wife Jezebel, who was the daughter of a pagan king, the king of Sidon. Jezebel, God is Baal, or God is Bel. These men were put into the king's employ by her because they speak for her God. And there is no more of a wicked influence in the planet in this day than Jezebel, so much so that her name would be used to characterize a spirit that takes down the prophets of God and leads his people astray even into this day and into the last days. So he now says to Ahab, verse 41, go up, eat and drink, because it's been a famine for three years. People, have, there's been scarcity, and even the king has not just been eating and drinking in the way that he's accustomed to. So he'll take that. 
go up and eat and drink, there's the sound of the abundance of rain. And I don't know if that was a sound that anyone else heard but Elijah because of these preceding verses. Verse 42, so Ahab went up to eat and drink and Elijah went to the top of Carmel and then he bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up and looked and said, there's nothing. And seven times he said, go back, go again, go look again. And it came to pass the seventh time that he said, there's a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. So Elijah said, go up and say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. So it appears from what the servant sees that there's no sign of rain. And I just want to point out real quickly that Elijah hears a sound nobody's heard in three years. And he might be the only one who heard it. It was the sound of abundance. It wasn't the sound of a potential sprinkle. It was the sound of abundance. And I believe he knows the sound that's consistent with the word that God has spoken to him. God had told him that at your word, the rain would stop. And at your word, the rain would come again. It was the command of God. And so he hears a sound consistent with his faith. And his faith is in the word of God. His faith is not in the sound. His faith is in the word of God. But this is a sound of faith. And he acts upon it. And he keeps on acting upon it. Seven times he prays because he's heard something in here that he knows is from God and he's not going to stop acting upon it. And that's how the Lord would have every one of us to be. That when we really have a word from God and when we have the word of God, that we learn what a consistent sound is. And we take hope in that and we act upon that but there are also inconsistent sounds verse 45 now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind so this isn't just you know some clouds that are up there that have the potential to drop some rain a storm has emerged there's wind the sky is dark and it's about to break loose and there was heavy rain. The same word there for heavy means mighty. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah and he girded up his loins and he ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. This is where Ahab had built his house some years before. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Now, why had he done that? Why is the first person that Ahab talks to Jezebel? Because I think up to this point, Elijah believes Ahab has come to repentance. And the fact is, a chapter and a half later, Ahab will, two chapters later, somewhere in there, he will come to repentance. He will humble himself. And for three years, things are, are fairly good. He doesn't become a radical man of God, but he humbles himself. And the Lord takes note of it and spares him in his generation from what he would have otherwise faced. But Elijah doesn't realize what's going on. And Elijah is in this mindset that we just accomplished victory. His mindset is this battle is over. We won. 850 prophets are dead. The king responded to my command. And now I'm waiting for him to come out either with her by the head of the hair and order her to be executed or something good, something consistent with the word of God. But little does he know the first thing that King Ahab does is goes and confides in her, goes and vents to her and why would he do that because the reality is she's the shot caller she's the one who's been calling all of the shots for probably the majority of his administration as king from behind the scenes she's learned 
that she can do whatever she wants to do. And their relationship is like this because he's somewhat of a coward and he's somewhat indecisive and he refuses to lead like a man should. And so slowly but surely, he helped to build this woman that we now know as Jezebel through his indecisiveness and his lack of leadership. Because here's the reality, and this is not meant to hurt any woman, but God did not create a woman to lead primarily. He created a woman to be a helpmeet to a man that would lead something. And without that woman, guess what? The man cannot do what he was called to do. It's not a good thing for him to try to do it alone unless a man learns to humbly be able to listen to his wife. A man has the equal opposite problem. He will in his arrogance and pride absolutely fall on his big fat arrogant face. But this is not Ahab. Ahab in his indecisiveness has helped the enemy to build this woman who now has become the Jezebel. And the relationship is such that he knows really all he has to do is just tell her what's going on and she will act. And what she has done throughout this entire period has been completely atrocious. She's turned the people away from God She's killed the prophets of the Lord. And she has merciless, mercilessly dealt with anyone who stood in the way of her getting whatever either he or she wanted. She's the shot caller. And the only reason he even goes to her is because he's not repentant. Because he is upset. And so Jezebel, verse 2, sends a messenger to Elijah. And the messenger said, so let the gods do to me and more even if I don't make your life like the life of one of them, meaning those prophets you slaughtered by tomorrow about the same time. By tomorrow about this time, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to slaughter you. I'm going to have you slaughtered just like you slaughtered my prophets. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba. Now understand something. The reality is Elijah was never in this battle for the Lord, this battle that is the Lord. He was never really wrestling against King Ahab. He was wrestling against the influence behind Ahab. And ultimately, that is what we too wrestle with as Christians. We don't wrestle with flesh and blood. We wrestle against spiritual wickedness. And Jezebel is just the mascot. She's just the face for a host of demonic spirits that want to turn the people of God to idolatry, turn them into compromise and away from the Lord that want to rob the zeal of the people of God by giving them an appetite. That's another word for zeal, a hunger for the things of this world and the things that this world has to offer. And when he sees the messenger and when he hears what the messenger says, look what he does because he's human. Remember what James says? He was a man subject to like passions. That just means he was a man just like us. He didn't have any special thing going on with God beyond what is available to every single person in this building right now. He was just like you. Don't take anything away from that. It means all that it's meant to mean. And he ran away. He was scared for his life. And he went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. And he left his servant there. But he himself, verse 4, went a day's journey into the wilderness. And he came and sat down under a juniper tree. He gets away even from his servant because he's dejected. He's despondent and depressed. And he wants to be alone. He's failed. I was, I was looking up this morning just thinking and meditating on this feeling and thinking about Elijah here, but also my own experiences and how this feels. You know, it's, it's one thing to just fail, but it's another thing to get up 
and to do something with all the faith and all the belief and all the energy of someone who believes they're going to succeed, who believes they're going to win, and, and who has fought for and stood and sweat to get to this place and then to fail. It's a different, it's a different thing to have in his mind, worked so hard and made so many sacrifices and swallowed a life of being somewhat alone and rejected and opposed, then to have this amazing experience up on Mount Carmel and ultimately now he's running for his life. Because somehow this woman is so bold that she can see 850 of her people slaughtered and the rain come on the heels of a famine that was orchestrated by God and still stand up and say, I don't care. I'm going to kill you. And that is the enemy that we face. The enemy is just that bold with the people of God because God allows him to be that bold. God allows the enemy sometime to get right up in your faith, face and breathe out the most venomous, threats and he knows how to he knows how to hit a chord he knows how to strike a chord to make these things hit home if there's something that he can say that he can do to make you afraid to get you to quit he will do it and sometimes the Lord will let him and so Elijah man he's he's upset he, he's basically just done I mean that's what the scripture tells us He's up under this broom tree, this juniper tree, and he begins to pray that he might die. And he says, it's enough. Some of your Bibles have an exclamation point there because the, the word, it, it's not that of excitement. It's that of absolute uh, exhaustion and exasperation. It's an exclamation of just having uh, quit, not having anything left. In the Hebrew, what it means is too much for me. This was too much for me. It's enough. I'm no better than my fathers. I failed. I couldn't do it. I thought I could do it. And see, that is a blessing from God to have the capacity to believe that you can actually win, that you can actually succeed in doing things that nobody else has ever done before. That's a blessing from God. That's zeal for the Lord. To actually stand up, not care where others failed, or how no one else has ever tried to do it this way. No one else has ever really gone in this direction and say, but I heard God, so I'm going in this direction, and I expect to be victorious. That capacity to believe that way is from God. But there's a danger there, like Paul expresses in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians rather, that you can be in those successes. You imagine, Elijah's up on Mount Carmel. What's he doing? He's getting sarcastic. He's in the bathroom. He's sleeping. And God is letting it go. But you can't tell me that he's not getting to that place where, because nothing he says falls to the ground where there's a risk of arrogance. Even Paul said that, that through the abundance of revelation, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger from Satan to box me, to buffet me, lest I be exalted. And this kept Paul humble. And one of the revelations, the, the chief revelation he came out of this experience was, in my weakness, your strength is made perfect in me. Your grace is sufficient. I'm not sufficient. Your grace is sufficient. Your grace is sufficient. I'm not sufficient for these things. He would later say, and who's sufficient for these things? We don't have any confidence in the flesh. We boast in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and there's a danger, and he's got to get this to really succeed. He's got to understand this, that don't ever think that you're something when you're nothing. Don't ever think more highly of yourself than you ought to, but think soberly about yourself. But think everything of God. 
Think everything of God. And so here he is, he's dejected, and he's praying that he would just, just go ahead and die. And as he laid there, verse 5, and slept under the juniper tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat, get up and eat. And this just shows how compassionate God is with us when we're like this. I mentioned a few weeks ago, Jonah under his little, you know, sh shaded little vine tree that grew up for him. But he got so attached to that thing. You know, so attached to, man, God's, I just need to be here not doing anything, you know, like hiding away, like David. Oh, that I had the wings of a dove that I'd fly away and rest. I keep hearing myself, that song will come out of me. I'm not even thinking about it. We're driving down the road the other day, and I'm looking out the window, and I realize I'm singing that song, and I'm like, why? And it was just the sky brought it out of me. And I started just thinking like, yeah, I'd rather be an eagle than a dove so I could really just get away, you know, quickly. But that's how you can feel. And this is where Elijah is. And when you feel that way, God has compassions. He's a God of compassions, plural. He's got compassions that he creates specifically for you that have your name on them that nobody else has quite experienced the way that you will when you're suffering like that. In despondency and depression. He says, as he arises and eats and drinks, nothing, the, the angel of the Lord, I'm ahead of myself, verse 7, and the angel of the Lord comes back a second time because Elijah just goes right back to sleep. He says, get up and eat. And he acknowledges what Elijah has already confessed. The journey is too great for you. Essentially what I've called you to do is, is far greater than what you're capable of. And, and I think this really is God's way of saying, you know, I, I never expected you to have to accomplish this in your own strength, in your own resource. I've always known that this is too great for you. That's not a surprise to me. I know that it's hitting you right now as a revelation and you feel like an absolute failure. But let me let you into something. You always pretty much were. That's your, you know, top end capability. But he's got to give him something from heaven, and that's what we need when we're in that moment. And man, God is faithful. Man, he will attend you with angels, maybe invisible, but that minister to you the food of heaven when you're in those moments and you get this strength from the Lord. And all you have to do is just be a child, just be a, a weak child who says, I have nothing left. And I'm ready to die. I've given up. And God just responds to that and says, Here, eat. I love you. Rest. Eat. Comes up, wakes him up. You know, it's not like Peter where Peter's in jail and gets smacked. You know, different situation. So he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights. As far as Horeb, the mountain of God, this food enables him to get to a place so that he can be reestablished with God. That's the purpose behind why God's given it to him. And you know that it's supernatural because he doesn't eat again after this for 40 days. You know, and there are times sometime when the Lord will speak something to you and maybe a little while will, will go by before you hear something else. And it's because right now, that's all you need to hear and you just need to keep on hearing it you just need to keep reminding yourself I'm not enough God is enough this was always him this was always his battle and there he went into a cave and he spent the night in that place because he's he's not out of this and behold the word of the Lord came to him and he said to him what doest thou here Elijah I like the old King James better in this one the word of the Lord came to him and he said what are you doing here Elijah and, and it really isn't so much a rebuke and yet it is maybe so he said I have been very zealous I have been very zealous 
I, I, I've done everything that I could. I poured my heart into this. I'm not saying that I'm perfect. I'm not saying that I'm Job. I'm not saying that I'm Daniel, but I'm going to say this to you, God. I've been very zealous for you. You know my love for you has driven me to sacrifice and do things for you. I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. Because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets, with the sword and I'm the only one left and now they seek to take my life and he wasn't the only one left and he probably actually kind of knew that because he had talked to Obadiah and he had known what Obadiah did and hiding these probably younger people of God but he feels like he's the only one who has this kind of zeal he's the only prophet of this kind he's the only one who's put his life on the line that's what he he feels like. And he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. This is God speaking to him. And behold, the Lord passed by. So he goes out of the cave and he stands there and the Lord passes by. And I think we know Elijah doesn't see him, but he knows the Lord is there. It says, a great wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire... A gentle whisper, a still small voice, a gentle whispering voice, depending on the version that you have. And so it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in a mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Why, though? It could, because he had already gone out of the cave. He had already gone out of the cave in verse 11 at the command of the Lord and stood on the mountain before the Lord to see these great sights take place. But now somehow he's back in the cave. And at the gentle whispering voice, he wraps his face in a mantle and comes just to stand in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice comes to him and says, what doest thou here, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? Same thing. Same thing. And here's what I believe the Holy Spirit said to me about what's actually going on here. Elijah's in the cave and he's despondent and the way that Elijah perceives God is, is maybe because of Mount Carmel as he's the God who answers by fire. This is God. He does big things and makes things explode. And you know when he's there because stuff's exploding and burning and shaking. And you read that kind of stuff all throughout the scripture, especially in the Psalms definitely in the revelation but there's something very precise to be learned here and God wants Elijah to get it and so I think what's happening is he calls Elijah out of the cave God hears his voice he says, what are you doing here Elijah and then he calls him out of the cave and then as soon as he comes out of the cave, I think what happens is immediately this mighty wind rushes through and just starts to ferociously attack the side of the mountain and he's seeing boulders rip off and fly with the force of something he's never seen before. And what does he do? What would you do? I'm headed back to the cave immediately. I'm not standing in all of that feeling like this, especially when I'm questioning maybe is God even for me like I thought he was. 
But God did say stand there, and so perhaps he creeps on back out. And right about that time that he creeps out, immediately an earthquake. And the shaking, and he runs more than likely back in. And I'm not taking full license here because the word tells us he goes out and then he's found back in at the last whisper of God. And then finally, one more time, he comes back out because God really wants him to get this. And so a third time, here comes the blazing fire. And you would think, okay, maybe he's not the God of the wind and yet if you read the story of Pentecost you would argue with that if you read the splitting of the Red Sea you might want to argue that maybe he's not the God of the shaking the earthquake you'd certainly want to argue that one if you've ever read the Revelation if you've ever read the Old Testament but certainly he's the God of fire I mean he's the God who answered by fire on Mount Carmel but see, I believe what he's saying is that that's not how he speaks to his people generally. And so this gentle whisper takes place. And now he wraps his face in a mantle. Because more than in these other three events, he perceives the presence of God. And he approaches with more respect and reverence in this case than before and comes just to the mouth of the cave. But see, I think what God was doing was showing him how he reacts to things, where he's really at in his faith. Because the, the earthquake and, and the wind and the fire and the, the shaking that happens and the rocks that are flying and the response likely that takes place that for whatever reason has him back in that cave, this is exactly in a small picture what took place when he heard that bad report from Jezebel's messenger. It said back there that when he saw the messenger, when he heard what that messenger had to say, what did he do? He ran. He heard a sound that was inconsistent with his faith. But it was mighty. It was powerful, but it was inconsistent with the word of God. But it was mighty and it was powerful and he responded by running from it. And now here he is, and God's showing him, Elijah, this is what you've done. And all this takes place, and he runs. And I think Elijah is, is meant to realize here, man, I've been responding to things that are inconsistent with what God has said to me. This is not the voice of God. God's not in the wind, God's not in the shaking, God's not in the fire. This is my God. Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Why did you give up? Why did you end up here? Because you're responding to the wind. Peter's on the water and he begins to see the wind and the waves and he starts to sink. Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians that the reason why God has given leaders within a church that when they're really from him is in order to equip people so that they would be no more tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, every wind of influence, because we are moved by the wind. We're moved by our circumstances. We're moved by big, scary things in life. And what God is really saying to Elijah here and what he's saying to me in my life right now and what I 
believe the Holy Spirit wants you to know this morning is don't be moved by those big things when they're inconsistent with what I've spoken to you. Stand on this. And don't be greatly moved, as David said, or as Paul said, but none of these things move me. Why? Because I'm standing on this. And so when the wind comes, I'm not running. When the earth shakes, I'm not running. When the fire heats up, I'm not running. I'm going to stand because the God who knows how to whisper through it, I'm with you. My word still stands. It's as good today as it's ever been in spite of the wind, in spite of the fire, in spite of the shaking. Stand. And I, I believe Elijah, I believe he gets that. And he stands there in the entrance of the cave and the voice of God, what are you doing here, Elijah? But he comes out with his, his statement again because he's not quite internalized this yet. I've been very zealous. He's got this thing down pat because like us, when we're in that circumstance, we get our spiel going. Lord, I blah, 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 and I blah, 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 and you blah, 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 and they blah, blah, blah. And that's, that's my perspective right here. And God doesn't come in and, and say like, hey, I'm very sorry. Let me really just explain in detail all of these things so that you can just fully understand and everything. You'll be okay once you understand it. I just need to explain it to you. That, by the way, again, it's, I know beating a, a, a dead horse, pounding a single drum, but that, by the, by the way, is why you can't get the answers you need from a pastor. He can point you to Jesus. She, he, leaders, friends that love the Lord can point you to Jesus, but he's got the answers. And even if someone did sit down and explain it to you, it would not do within you what needs to get done for you to get transformed like you need to be to stop doing what you're doing or start doing what God's called you to do. You have to be able to get it from God. That doesn't mean that we don't call upon each other when when we're in need, we need to know how to speak a word in season, give good counsel. But he rehearses his thing. I alone am left into verse 14, and they seek to take my life. And then the Lord said to him, go. Go back. Go return. On your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hezael, king of over Assyria and when you anoint Jehu when you get there anoint Jehu the son of Nimshi as king over Israel and Elisha the son of Shaphat of Abel Mahola you're gonna anoint him as prophet in your place so you can take that like oh you failed man you're getting replaced that's not the message that's not what God's saying and it'll be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazael Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of, of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet, or hey, by the way, I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. You know what the Lord's saying to him? This is what you were supposed to accomplish. This is victory. Jezebel was never going to repent. In fact, prophecies issued before this that the dogs would lick her blood, that she would be a part of a crowd who would be eaten by dogs, but this is the victory. And more than that, more than that, Elijah, and this comes back to the part where we understand our insufficiency in light of his sufficiency you're a hero and yet you're not the hero you're not the hero of this story it doesn't end here these thousands of years ago 
You don't usher everyone into the eternal kingdom. And on the hills of Mount Carmel now, everything is done, finito, resolved. You did it. No, somebody else is coming. One set of lips will utter, it is finished. And it's me who loves you and who's appointed you and who's not done with you. What are you doing here, Elijah? Go back. And he moves back into his role and he begins to anoint kings and he begins to ordain prophets because they are going to carry this on. I think today, for the first time in my life, I understand Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He that began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. That doesn't mean that you end your story looking perfect <laughs> like we think it does. What do you mean? Like you said you were going to complete it. I'm not like, you know, like my brother died and he was, had a lot of rough edges still. But you say you're going to complete it. Yeah, until the day of Christ, man, the same. You don't finish this work. <laughs> the body of Christ. Christ through the body of Christ finishes this work. We do it together. Hey, Elijah, I love how zealous you are. But there's 7,000 people waiting for you to join them. And you're going to be a blessing to him. And so is Elisha. And Elisha's going to have this school. I wish I could show you, Elijah, how it's going to work out. And there's going to be these, what we're going to call the sons of the prophets. And they're going to grow and they're going to prophesy and they're going to do mighty things. And the victory is sealed. Because at the end of it all, the line of Judah is going to come out and put his foot on the neck of the enemy. And he'll be able to say, finito. He'll be able to say, it is finished. I want to challenge you today, Josh, if you'd come back up with two things. And I want to just encourage us. You know, in this generation, I can't point, point around really so much and say, prophet, prophetess, prophet. I mean, after one sense, you can, but really it's always been, as Moses said to Joshua when he was jealous for Moses because some others were prophesying, Moses said, I wish all God's people would prophesy. Are you kidding, Joshua? And then... Joel chapter 2, it'll come to pass afterward, saith the Lord, that your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. On your hand maidens and on your servants I'll pour out my spirit, saith the Lord. Pour out my spirit on all flesh. We see partial fulfillment in the book of Acts, but Joel would go on to tell us that then would come the great and notable day of the Lord. In other words, that period would begin at the book of Acts and it would continue until the great and notable day of the Lord. And those prophets of the sons and daughters of all flesh, meaning Gentile and Jew alike, would bring in this day that the Bible calls the great and notable day, the great and awesome day day of the Lord in which the earth would be on fire and the moon would turn to blood in which Christ would ultimately come and one more time say in light of the finished work of the cross it is done as he does in the Revelation chapter 20 but that's all of you here that's who God's called you to be and I believe that it's very likely that most of us are either in one of two places. One, 
Maybe you were at some point despondent, dejected, depressed, disappointed, felt like a failure, and you, you hung it up. And you did it because you listened to things and you respond to the things that you saw and that you experienced that you were supposed to see and hear and, and experience, but they were test. You were meant to hold on to the founded, rock-solid Word of God that's capable of right through the middle of a storm. See, this is why Jesus is sleeping in the back of the boat when the storm comes and the waves are going all crazy because he's not moved. Because he knows. That's not my father telling me to do anything. I'm taking a nap right now. And that's why he gets up with holy irritation <laughs> and rebukes the wind and the waves peace be still and then speaks to them the way that he does rebukes them out of love and, it, and maybe you're here today and you know that God has had a call on your life and you've never gone as far into it as he's wanted you to and he wants so much more for you than you want for yourself he wants to heal you so much more than you want to be healed. He wants to use you so much more than you want to be used. And you can just add a different phrasing, but he wants it more for you than you want it for yourself. And you stopped. And now you've lost your zeal. And you could be in the place where you're just in danger of losing it because you're struggling inside like Elijah and you're, you're dealing with depression and what the heck is God really saying to me through all of this that's going on and what God is really saying to you this morning is hey, get your eyes off that what are you doing? stopping you know what I've said to you you know what I've called you to do you know what my word says go back get back to work or you could have been in that place where you've completely lost it and if you would stand with me we're going to worship if, if that's you you've completely lost it or perhaps you've never even known what it is to have zeal for the Lord zeal is fuel you know zeal is the fire of God's spirit within you that propels you forward and gives you the wherewithal and the energy and the will and the sheer holy determination from God to do things that other people cannot do cannot even want to do long enough to actually accomplish them and it may be that you've run out of that you know Paul says never be lacking in zeal you know keep your fire burning that's Jeremiah saying I, I tried to stop speaking I tried to but the fire was like it was just like shut up in my bones like the flames were just trying to get out and I, I had this sense that I was stifling in it and I'm about to combust and as afraid as I was of their faces and their potential to do me great harm I had to speak I had to do. I had to serve. I had to say what God had put in my heart. You know, I feel like the Lord showed me something I've never paid a lot of attention to this morning. That last church Jesus talks about in the Revelation, Laodicea. We kind of hate that church. Like if you read the word and you know the scriptures, you kind of hate that church. When you find a church that you think sucks, you call it Laodicea. It's like a cuss word for people who love the Lord. Like you can call the tabernacle whatever you want, but if you call it Laodicea, I'm going to truly be offended. And start having, that's a great one, and start having to ask some questions and... Like, what are we? 
But I feel like the Lord showed me that we've all got a little bit of Laodicea going on inside of us. Let me show you what I mean as we worship God. I think the church of Laodicea became what it became for one reason. It just started letting its zeal slip away. The end of that road is Laodicea when you let your zeal slip away. And some of us, maybe you completely lost it and your affections were turned from God to the things of the world because you were there, you tried. Man, some people even joke, I thought like God was really going to use me, yeah, when I was younger and man, I even thought I was a prophet of the Lord and and now, yeah, like the new Mario Brothers game out, man. Let's go bowling after church. I'm not making fun of that. I just couldn't resist. Bowling's fun, man. We'll go witness to all the people in the bowling alley. How about that, huh? Right? <laughs> but that's what happens. I mean, but listen to Jesus, man. I just, don't you love Jesus because of how much he loves us, man? Nobody ever is going to love us this way. I mean, and he can make you feel it. You know, he, I think he delights in it. Look, look at what he says to him. I know your works. He calls himself the true witness. I'm about to tell you something true. That's what he means by, I know your works. I, I know your condition. I wish you were cold or hot. Because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot and I'll vomit you out of my mouth. I'll spew you out of my mouth. You know, you know what he's really saying right there? He's saying, you know how hard you're making this on me? You don't realize what position you're putting me in? If you were cold, if you were just a dirt, rocking, rotchy, fish shaking enemy you have to understand God created man in his image he's emotional if you've missed that you become very dry in your faith and lose the ability to love he's saying you're making this hard, so hard on me because you're still kind of trying to have a relationship with me I would really rather man that if you're not going to just be on fire that you would just be totally stone cold because you're breaking my heart. And if ever there is and will be the possibility that someone in me would have to get spewed out, you're headed in that direction. So I counsel you to buy gold tried in fire. You know what that means? I'm bringing something into your life you're not going to like because I love you. I'm about to put you through some things that will fund the cost of you getting your zeal back. I counsel you to buy gold refined and fire that you may be rich. I want you to be rich and have white garments unstained, unblemished that you may be clothed so the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. I don't want you to be like the man without a proper garment shows up before the king and is cast out so that your eyes may be anointed with eye salve that you would be able to see again like I see. Anybody just, can you capture it just for a moment? You haven't been seeing like you used to, feeling the feelings of God, hearing the voice of God like you at one time did, then hear Jesus saying to you, I want you to see that way again. I want you to feel what I feel. I want you to hear what I hear again and occupy the place that I've, I've called you to. This is a love letter to these people and to us. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten that's why I'm about to deliver this spanking. Because I love you so much and I can't stand 
to see you this way, and I don't want it to end badly. Therefore, be zealous. That's his command. Be zealous and repent. Last verse, we'll worship him. You guys can hit the lights. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Man, these aren't just words. They're not just words. Man, they're not just words. I hope you don't think that getting into the presence of God and experiencing the presence of God is just some weird cliche. I got to spend this morning with Jesus and I'm a wretch. I'm a failure. And he spent the morning with me. And he's willing to come in. He's willing to dine with you. He's willing to to be with you show you that he loves you and all you have to do is just say yes do it just do it and all that that means is we worship him and maybe you're just you know some of us you're you're not like totally just totally gone but you just want to be more zealous for the Lord more on fire for him man he delights in that he wants you hot he just said it Anybody ever tells you he doesn't want you to be radical? They're crazy. They've missed it. So let's come to the fire this morning. Let's come to the Holy Spirit this morning. Let's come to Jesus. And let him fill us. Let him grant us repentance. Let him whisper to us. Let him affirm his love over us. Whatever he needs to do, he'll, he'll do that. Let's worship God. This first one won't be on the slides. Word of God, speak. Would you pour down like rain? Washing my eyes to see your majesty. To be still and know that you're in this place. Please let me stay and rest. to us, Holy Spirit. stricken by God, smitten and afflicted, but 
he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. 